White Centipede Noise podcast is made possible by your support via Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash white centipede noise to support and stay tuned to hear about the exclusive benefits and bonus content available with this episode. White Centipede Noise is a label and mail order specializing in noise, power electronics, and industrial music. You can find underground items by many of the artists featured on this podcast in our extensive distro. We ship internationally and update with new stock regularly. Check out what's currently available at whitecentipedenoise.com. Hello and welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. I'm Oscar Brummel and today my guest is Andrew Grant of the project The Vomit Arsonist, Providence-based powerhouse of bleak and cinematic death industrial. Known for his heavy concept-based albums often drawing direct influence from film and literature as well as deeply personal topics. Andy, hello and welcome to White Centipede Noise Podcast. Hey, Oscar, how you doing? Good. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Yeah, sure. Um, so we know you as the Vomit Arsonist. Yep. It's a project you're quite active with these days, but you've been active for quite a while with it. Yep. And I would, I mean, not to make it about me, but I, I feel like we kind of sort of maybe started doing these sorts of things around a similar time and yeah uh when when did you start I, I i mean i started messing around in like 2005 but i started okay doing what i do now like taking it more seriously in like 2008 probably seven eight. yeah yeah 2008 is kind of when i when i became aware of you and when i also yeah. started getting heavily involved so so can you tell me a little about the project how it's evolved over time like what it was in 2008 versus what it is now if there's been any changes how many th- how things have changed what hasn't changed yeah yeah um yeah there's been there's been a ton of changes um in well i mean it like it started like again like 2004 2005 and that was like right after i kind of discovered harsh noise and mm-hmm. um was like pretty quickly like i need to do this um and then it it was very unfocused and very uh, there was like, I tried to have like a performance art or like weird absurdist aspect to it. And, but I would never actually call it that cause it wasn't that good. Um, what did you it, was do? Just sort of like, it was sort of like influenced by that type of stuff. It was just absurd and weird and funny almost. Um, what kind of performance art stuff did you do? Can you describe it? Uh, mostly just annoying people and trying to be like, a pain in the ass it shows like you know okay. just like truly like just being annoying okay um, we did that for a very short amount of time but you know i was like 18 19 yeah. so uh, yeah. i was a kid and then uh 2005 i moved to providence and that's when i started kind of like really shifting it to be a more serious thing and then with, over the next few years it got um you know it all it was all like basically just harsh noise in the beginning like I mean, I had some beats and stuff, but it was usually just noise. Um, and as a, as the project went on, it kind of became, you know, sort of darker, more industrial, more dark ambient, power electronics, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and like, I still do noisy stuff, but I wouldn't call it noise anymore. Um, right. So yeah, it just sort of, it sort of naturally progressed into this thing. What it is now, how, I mean, not that it's necessarily necessary, but how would you genreify it? What would you classify it as in terms of industrial? Yeah, I call it industrial music, death industrial. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, I feel like that's the best kind of blanket term for it. Um, yeah. And even, so once you locked it in with kind of the focus it has now, mm-hmm. you know, early releases like Reciprocation, Wretch, how are those perhaps different or what has happened between those and like your most recent album? Yeah. Uh, no, those are, those are really different. Reciprocation especially was like, that was like a good reciprocation was like a bridge, I think from kind of messing around and not really taking it very seriously to having it be a much more focused thing. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it was all just a lot noisier and and um i don't know like what's what's different about it it just sounds different mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I i don't know it's it's i'm trying to think like what happened well um, you're pretty proficient with like audio technology and audio skills so i mean were you that proficient at that time as well yeah yeah i've been i've been like recording music and sound at home since i was like you know like 14 okay um, like like windows sound recorder or whatever that program was that came on everyone's computer yeah. um messing with that and so yeah i've been doing it for ever um yeah yeah do you feel like you've dialed that in in terms of i mean you do mastering too and stuff like that in terms of the the technical side of it more or was it pretty technically it's it's i I, i've definitely dialed in about as much as i can there's people who do things way better than me um mastering for example (laughs) um but uh yeah yeah i think i kind of kind of honed it and there is a multiple CD compilation currently in the works, representing the first two years of White Centipede Noise podcast. It will feature new material from the artists that have been on the show, paired with excerpts from their interview. The 300 personalized copies will only be available to Patreon supporters, and it will only go to press once the Patreon has reached 300 members, so be sure to sign up now to move this thing into production. The final lineup will be announced on October 18th, which marks the two-year birthday of White Centipede Noise podcast. But don't wait until then. Head over to patreon.com slash white centipede noise now to be part of this epic compilation of contemporary and classic noise. The albums tend to have a lot of times a really conceptual focus. Yeah. Have you always worked that way? Yeah, uh, yeah. No, it's always it's always been even when even in the very beginning, it was always about each release was about a thing that happened or something I was going through or something I disliked or a book or a movie or, you know, something like that. Um, Mm -hmm. I, even now, like I'll, I'll, I'm kind of always writing stuff. I'm always recording. And like, I just, I always have my stuff set up. I'm always ready to just hit record and go. Um, and a lot of times what I'll do is just kind of record things and then figure out the theme later. Mm -hmm. So it, I don't always, sometimes it's backwards. I don't always have like, okay, I'm going to do a release about this and then record a bunch of shit. Oftentimes it's, I record a bunch of shit and they go, Oh, okay. This kind of sounds like this, or I want to make this fit into this thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, there's always a theme that's, that's always, that's always been really important to me. Like having some kind of, not just like a collection of songs, but like, yeah, something that tells a story. Can you talk about the concepts behind some of the, some of your albums? Like for example, reciprocation, like that's kind of the, if that's, if that might be the bridge or the kind of starting point of modern day vomit arsonist. (laughs) Reciprocation was like a precursor to Wretch, um, which was about a girl <laughs> and um, went through a really bad breakup experience that had a really profound effect on me for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And um, that was kind of the way to get everything out. Um, okay. So Reciprocation was kind of like, it was about that same time period and that same, those same experiences, but Wretch was a much more fleshed out, much more like focused conceptual kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's way better personally. Sure. Um, but yeah, the, the, those are, yeah, those are about a, a bad relationship. A lot of it's about bad relationships. <laughs> Hopefully that theme is, uh, phase itself out. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't touch on that one much anymore, which is, is good. Like, there's yeah. other, other bad things to touch on. So, yeah. What about Bridgewater? Bridgewater was, um, that was about, about, it's, uh, there's a documentary called Titicut Follies that uh, people have probably seen it in, uh, uh, Michael Nine used it for backing video for Death Squad. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's been used a bunch of different ways. And it's this this documentary that was filmed in the early 60s in uh, Bridgewater State Hospital in Bridgewater, Massachusetts. It was a hospital for the criminally insane. Um, and it was, they actually, the state blocked the movie from getting released because it was too graphic. They were basically, they, this guy went in there with a camera and just was sort of like fly on the wall and was just 
you know, capturing all this footage of these these old men being exploited and beaten and tortured and and just treated really, really badly, like horrible conditions. Even for even for the early sixties, it was yeah. bad. Um, so the state actually was able to block the release of the movie. You could only get it through like an educational grant. Um, Cause it was probably also a state run. Yeah. Yeah. So they didn't, they're like, we don't need this, you know, this kind of shit. So, um, but I ended up, I ended up seeing the movie in a psychology class in college and mm. like immediately had a huge effect on me. I was like, I just, it, it's so, it's such a bleak, like stark, thing and that that's i love all that shit yeah. um so i i've watched it a bunch of times and kind of just did this sort of conceptual release about the people in who were in there at the time I, it's not i don't think it's still there um i think it's it's been closed for a while um but yeah it's that that one was more that there was a lot of like improv on that one because i did it i did it all live it was like one i think it was actually yeah. a live set and oh. um I did just kind of a lot of it on the fly and it incorporates, it actually incorporates other songs from other releases that hadn't come out yet. Like I was recycling samples and stuff. Cool. Um, but yeah, the, and, and I, I did the whole, the performance had the backing video with, with the movie and everything. At the time I did not know that Michael Nine and other people had been using it so much. I, okay. I may have it differently <laughs> if I had known that, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's that. I think there's, there's certain things that like-minded people are just gonna land on. I saw um, at uh, Dominion of Flesh last September, uh, DSM three was like they were playing, and I looked up and I'm like, oh shit, they're using Tinica Follies. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good one. It's a classic. <laughs> what about uh, the release "Go Without"? Uh, "Go Without" was. Um, I've, uh, I've, I've been dealing with like, with, you know, mental health issues, depression and anxiety for most of my life. And I've been on, um, I take meds, you know, a lot of people do, sure. um, but I've been taking them since I was like a child. And I mm -hmm. went through this period of time where I was like, like, you know, like I, I got put on, on drugs when I was a kid and like your brain's still forming and your personality's still forming. And like, maybe the things that they were treating then aren't the same as now. Yeah. Um, so that release was kind of about wanting to just be done with all of that. And um, I didn't actually, I, I did I, I, on a later release, I actually ended up not taking my meds for a year, which was not good. Um, mm -hmm. But the go without was kind of the impetus of that. It was like just being rid of uh, chemical dependency you know, via a pharmacist. Yeah. And was the, which was the later release that you did under the uh, process of being off? Med yeah. Or that, which, only, which one was that? Only red, um, was that was like, I, I, like I, I didn't, I say like, I stopped taking my meds. Like I just threw them out. I, like I was, I worked with my doctor and we did a whole, yeah. 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 Whole tapering off thing. But like, it's, it was bad, man. It was really bad. Yeah. Uh, I've heard like, of that. Get, really bad. You get like, you get real, like straight up withdrawal symptoms. Like I don't, I don't, I never mess with hard drugs or anything, but like yeah. I have a, I have a, I think I have a decent idea of what it might be like to have to come off that shit. And it's bad. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but between that and then actually having to deal with things, cause like, you know, you take these medications and it kind of, it straightens your brain out. It kind of just makes things even. And then when yeah. you don't have them, all that shit comes back and all that shit comes to the surface. So you're going through, you know, withdrawal symptoms so you're physically all messed up and then mentally yeah. you have to navigate all this stuff that you haven't been dealing with for however many years right um, and it's not and like you can take a vacation from life yeah exactly exactly and just but I, but I wrote the, i wrote and recorded the whole album in the midst of all of that and hmm. um i don't know i can hear it but i also know what i was what it was like at the time so yeah yeah, and I'm back on meds. I did that for a year, and then I was like, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. So yeah, but I got yeah, a yeah. you know a decent thing going now. So it's all right. Sure, sure. That sounds. Yeah. I mean, I want to talk about how it feels for you to be performing a little later, like because every time I met you, you seem like a very. I, I mean, I know these themes that you deal with, and I know that 
you know, you're pretty open about that and, and, but I don't know, you're always a very, seem like a very well-rounded, adjust, like well-adjusted, friendly, confident guy. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I try to be because it's like to, to like all the bad stuff, like that's all, that's all there. Like it's, I just, you, you kind of got to compartmentalize it. Like mm -hmm. for a really long time, I was not as well-rounded or friendly or <laughs> easy to get along with because I was letting all of that shit kind of run the show. Yeah. And over time I've learned, and just, just with, even just with getting older, like I've learned that you kind of have to, you can't, you can't, I can't live in that all the time because right. it's just not, it's not good. It's still there and I still deal with it, but it's, I've, I've figured, I've kind of figured out a way to, it just, it all goes into music basically. Like that's, yeah. that's why everything's so negative because it's got to go somewhere. Right. So uh, I mean, I, maybe similar to the questions I asked James Light when I asked him about, you know, his music as an outlet or as a receptacle for pain and, and depression. Mm -hmm how does that function for you? Does it, does it function as a positive outlet for that negativity? Uh, yeah, I, I actually, I remember when you asked him that question and I was like, I, I, that's a good one. Yeah. Um, James had a really good answer. Um, it, it does for me personally, it functions like it is, especially during like, like playing live. Um, it functions as a, it's, it's a good thing for the time. And then there might be like a little bit of like, you know, you get some endorphins or, or whatever mm -hmm. kind of adrenaline, but then after that, it's just sort of all returns. Um, so it's like in the moment it feels really good and it is a, a positive thing and it's a, 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 you know, it just makes you feel better. But then oftentimes it just kind of goes back to the way it was. But again, like yeah. I try not to live in that because if you just live in that mode, it's, it's not good. Right. Well, what about like sub subjecting yourself to other input? Like you mentioned, you watch this Tid Cut Follies movie like a lot, like over yeah. and over. And I can yeah. remember, I can imagine, I've never seen that and I, I would watch it, I'm sure. But I mean, I can imagine watching it over and over would make me feel like it's, absolute it's shit. Yeah. yeah. Like that, 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 that I, I'm into, I don't know. I've, <laughs> I can't, I've never like been able to figure out why, but like I like movies and books that make people feel bad. Like, of course. I, like, I don't know, like the, the, the more bleak and upsetting and depressing a movie is, the more I want to watch it, the more I'm going to yeah. like, um, I don't know. It, it like, it doesn't make me feel that way. I guess it doesn't yeah. make me like, I don't, I mean, I, I, I get like the movies have made me sad and stuff, but like, I don't know. Something about feeling really shitty is oddly appealing in, yeah. in specific ways. I, I don't know. Yeah. I understand. What about when you're on stage? Like, what do you feel when you're on stage? Because you, you, you do have a lot of, you exude a lot of confidence and power and, and how does that feel when you're pacing around the stage? You have the sound coming out and then you, and then you have the microphone. I mean, yeah, you do a yeah. lot of vocals. What is that experience I, like for you? What does that feel like? I, I appreciate you saying that it exudes confidence because it doesn't feel like that. Um, <laughs> um, it feels really good. It, it really does. I, 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 uh, right before it was 2019, I guess, right before the pandemic, I was like, I was getting really sick of playing shows. Like it just wasn't, I don't know. I just wasn't, wasn't feeling it. And then like January, 2020, I was like, I got like this, this surge of creativity. I was like, fuck yeah, I'm going to, I'm, 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 I bought a new mixer. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And then the pandemic hit and mm. everything went to shit. Um, but I kind of, so I didn't, I didn't play a show for like two years. So I kind of had all that time to sort of refine what I wanted to do and make it the way I really wanted it to be. And, um, but I don't know, it feels good. I like, I like doing it and I haven't yeah. been able to say that in a while, but I, I really like playing live and, you know, pacing around with a microphone and stuff. It's, it's, it's fun. I, I, yeah. I get it. I dig it. What was your first show back? Do you remember uh, there was, uh, middle of June to last year, 22, uh, was 
the uh, Black Leather Jesus, Straight Panic, and Moonbeam Terror tour came through Providence, and then cool. I, me, and uh, New Grasping Machina uh, played. Cool. And it was fucking. It was awesome. Like that was that was a really good show. Hell of a way to come back. Yeah. And then shortly thereafter, or I'm not sure the time frame. You must have played Dom- Dominion of Flesh. Must have been at some point that was uh yeah that was uh yeah black Lives Jesus was the beginning of the summer dominion flesh was september okay right? yeah. yeah yeah uh no wait i can't maybe I'm, i might be mixing up dates but either way yeah dominion flesh was uh september 22 and that was what an excellent time that was yeah <laughs> it's fucking good. how was that to to see everyone and, and get together i mean it's kind of a it was, it was it was great it felt it it was probably like the most normal feeling thing that I think any of us had really had in a long time. Um, plus, you know, I got to see people I don't ever get to see. Like, yeah, it, it was, it was like this really fucked up reunion of weirdos, and it was great. Really, really good. Awesome. Felt very inspired and like, like kind of like I don't know, yeah, inspired. I guess afterwards, like just seeing so many amazing sets, yeah, and talking to everybody. Yeah, it was it was really good. Yeah, I mean, that, Cloister, I think, is really great at kind of bringing together those really, yeah, I mean, he has such a specific taste and yeah. flavor and brings like the best of that world all together with his label and with his with his shows, you know, and well, also, well, you know, between big, big known people and unknown people also, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marcus consistently amazes me with like the things that he's able to, or the things that he was even willing to try to pull off. Right. Like, he's just like some things that he's mentioned that he's going to do in the future. It's like, you're fucking insane, but it's, it's all, it's all awesome. I mean, it's, he's a, he's a good dude, Marcus. Back to the concepts of your albums. Um, your most recent album, if I'm not mistaken, is "There's No Future." I want to be a part of. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 Which I have uh, back there. It's up there in the wall. Yeah. Um, what about a? Is it? Is there a concept specific concept behind that album? Uh, yeah. That that yeah. That's that's probably the loosest con- conceptual idea that I've had. Um, but it really it's be and but it's it's a it's a loose subject. Um. Again, that was written mostly during the pandemic, but it's not about that. Like, I, I, I always want to make that clear. Like, it was inspired because it's hard to not be inspired by all the weirdness that was happening. But it the wasn't. Situation. Yeah, it was, it's not like, it's not about it. Right. Um, it's kind of about everything that was just like, you know, nobody was really happy with 2020 or even 2021 as a whole. Yeah. And um, just like there was a period where things just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And 
even for me, for someone who actively seeks out that kind of stuff, it was getting kind of tiring. Yeah. Um, like you hit a, you hit a wall and you're like, okay, I need something good to happen because yeah. this is, just, this is too much shit. Um, but the, that kind of all of the songs on it are sort of about like, there was, there was this, there was always this big push for like, you know, when we get through this and when things go back to normal and, and, you know, whatever, whether it was the pandemic or like weird pol pol political shit or whatever, like when we get through this and get to the other side, everything's going to be fine. And I just can't see that. And yeah. like, still, I'm like, I don't, I don't know what everybody's talking about. Like for me personally, like you can't come up with a scenario that is going to make me go, oh, well, that's good. Um, I just don't, but, you know, there's no future that I want to be a part of I just, yeah. anything that anyone's going to come up with is not going to be i know how i want things to go but they won't go that way yeah you still feel that way yeah now more than ever uh yeah i think so <laughs> <laughs> do you feel like you're actually a through and through pessimistic guy in your day-to-day -day life no no not at all um I have, I definitely have that attitude and, and it like my, my pessimism is reserved largely for much bigger things. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things that I've always, that I've learned over the years is like, you, you know, there's only, you can't control everything. So, um, I try to live my life, you know, keep it small, keep it to things that I can control and things that I can deal with. And that's really all I can do. Um, and looking at the, you know, the world at large is, that's where the pessimism really comes in because it's like, you know, but, but also I'm like, what are you going to do? You know, like yeah. there's, you, there's, you have to kind of look at it and, and almost laugh because like, what, what, what the hell am I going to do? What is anybody going to do? Yeah. Like you just, just, just go with it and whatever happens, happens, you know, try and try and make things as tolerable as possible while you can. So you're able to find kind of <clears throat> solace or freedom or comfort and kind of just things yeah. even falling apart. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I, 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 you know, like I said, I live my life very small and kind of insulated and, um, you know, I have, you know, I, I play music. I have people I see, um, you know, but I've, I've kind of whittled things into a little, a nice little spot for myself and i'm 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 good with it still no hope for the future though no <laughs> <laughs> not 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 at large no no not yeah. at all yeah i can understand that yeah yeah um you, you we've touched on it a little bit but your works often are based around also film or books mm -hmm. you know some notable examples are you know the, the the works you've done based on Antichrist by Lars von Trier, right? And yeah. uh, I can't remember right now, but I think one of your albums is loosely based on The Road by Cormac McCarthy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, can you talk about drawing inspiration from film and and books? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, uh, it's well, both of the ones that you mentioned are you know again, it's like it's the bleakness. And that's, that's where the inspiration comes from, um, specifically. Uh, Antichrist was, that was actually Lee's, that was me and then Lee from Theologian. And mm -hmm. that was actually his idea. And it was, the movie had come out, um, I don't even think it was on, it was like, I think I had a downloaded copy of it. Like, you, you know, it didn't really hit theaters or whatever. Um, but I had seen it and Lee had seen it and he, like, we both became just like obsessed with this movie. And it was his idea. He's like, we should, we should do an album that is like not a soundtrack, but like something that feels like that movie and something mm -hmm. that sounds like it would fit with that movie. And um, he sent me a bunch of stuff. I went and took a bunch of field recordings out in the woods to get, because that's the whole, you know, the, the whole nature aspect of things. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of built it. And um, I, I think it's really good personally, yeah. but uh yeah, that was uh, that was Lee's thing, and then the one the the road that was um, none of us are worth saving from that was on Cloister a couple of years ago. Right. Yep, um, that was another one that sort of 
after the fact I was able to mold it into a into a cohesive narrative like I had these songs that were all about a thing and then I kind of noticed that well that sort of mirrors this story like quite a bit um, yeah. so I made a few changes to a few things and then I was like okay now it's officially like a loose interpretation um, but yeah I don't know I, I just I I draw a lot of inspiration from that stuff because uh, it, I like those I like those worlds I like that atmosphere and just yeah do you also feel like you're storytelling with the bomber narcissist i mean do you feel like your albums do you approach them in a kind of a cinematic way with or or, or in a literary way not as I, I like to i'd like to think that i do but it, i don't not as much as i as i i don't do it as much as i think that i do like okay. I, I, <laughs> I'd, I'd like that to be the the case but it's not it's not quite that intentional um i definitely did that with wretch that was like a, even like the music on that one, like it ebbs and flows and it's got a very, very deliberate kind of pacing to it. Mm -hmm. um, but, and there's a story for sure, but it's, it's, it's gotten a little less uh, focused on narrative and stuff as it's gone mm -hmm. on. But Interesting. I heard that you have a, a, an album in the works with, with Mac Shami. I, I assume it's God is War. Yep. collaboration with him based on no country for old men correct yep, yep. talk can you tell me about how, how's that going or what's what's the approach to that one that um so me and mac talked about doing that for we talked about it for like a year or two and it was always one of those like you know it's going to be awesome and we just kind of we both went off and did our own things um so we've, I've brought it up to him a few times. And then, uh, a couple months ago, I sent him a message and I was like, Hey man, I've been thinking about this. It's been on my mind. Like, what do you think? And he's like, I'm really busy, but he's like, fuck it. Send me source. I was like, okay. So I recorded like 40 minutes worth of, you know, mm -hmm. some synth, metal, some, you know, just different things and sent it to him. And within like a day or two, he sent back two or three songs that were basically done. Cool. And I was like, okay, this is fucking, we got it now. Like, this is it. Um, so like, as soon as he sent those back, I was like inspired, like, okay. And then we, within like, I think a week or two, we basically finished the album. Cool. Um, so it's finished. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's finished. Um, it's, it's a really good representation of both of our styles, I think, um, because you, I don't think you would necessarily equate the two of us sound wise like max all over the place with god is war and i'm doing you know mostly industrial music yeah um, but it works really well it, i can it, imagine it works really well i i i, I it, you guys are very different but i can i can i can hear that I, I, really I, well. I think people are really gonna really gonna like it like i think it's got potential to be a, a big deal so okay cool yeah I'm, I'm i'm really excited about it when's it coming out and who's putting it out do you know no don't know. Um, we like it's, I mean, it's, it's done, but you know, it still needs to get mastered. We still have to talk about artwork, you know, yeah. all that stuff. Um, yeah. but you know, the, the, the music's recorded. We've talked about, you know, shopping it to a few different labels. I'm going to kind of leave that to Mac cause he's better with that stuff than I am. Um, sure, sure. and he knows people. So, um, but you know, to me, like just as long as it gets out, I don't really, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. I just want people to hear it. And then w was that then finished a good ways before his recent death? Uh, Cormac McCarthy died like halfway through us recording it. Um, oh, really? Okay. It was, like, it was just, a, it was just Crazy. the way it worked out. Yeah, it was very strange. Okay. Um, and I was like, oh, shit. Like that, for just what weird time. I mean, he was like 90, so it wasn't really course, a surprise. Course. But, but still, like the timing of it, like, oh, we finally decided to work on this record and then he fucking dies. Um, but yeah, that was, that was kind of weird. I mean, you mentioned that you don't really work in a totally cinematic way as much as it might seem you do, but can you ever see yourself going, working more in a film direction, whether it be sound design or with visual arts or, or with storytelling or, you know, shifting the project or, or taking on a collaboration with something really more film oriented? Absolutely. That's that, like, that's like the ideal for me. Like, that's really what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, I've, you know, I've, I've done some like very small things for, you know, like just short films and things like that. Nothing really of note. 
um, like sound design or soundtrack kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, well, I did, I did the, um, the, I did the self release. Uh, I soundtracked the movie Threads, um, oh. which I did. Well, it's 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 like a third of the movie. It's like twenty five minutes long. Cool. Um, but it's basically like I did it live, and then I kind of just watched the movie and like made sounds that I thought would fit. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, I've I've, I've definitely. I've definitely messed with that in the past, but I, I would love to do that more. Like that's, that's kind of the ideal is like, you know, soundtrack, sound design, even, even fully sound stuff like that. You know, it's, yeah. it's, that's, that's where my heart is. I think. Cool. Cause you do work with, I mean, you, you mentioned a lot of live takes and live recordings and which by the way, I thank you for uh, sharing that awesome yeah, uh, rehearsal recording for the Dominion of Flesh uh, performance, which is awesome. But you, so you're, but you're able to build, like a quite cinematic, I would say, arc in a live setting, but you also really work a lot in post production. And I mean, I've seen yeah. snippets of you online. Like you do a lot of like pretty complex editing and 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 composition within like a computer, right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's I do a lot of it's, it's I do a lot of like copy paste stuff. So you know, record. 10 minutes of me messing around with an MS 20 or something like that. Yeah. And then go back and listen to it and pick out the spots that are, you know, this would be a good loop or, you know, if I stretch this out and throw reverb on it, it's a good bass or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, but it's, yeah, I, I rarely do. I, I, that that's, yeah. Rarely do I like turn all my stuff on and, and like, no, okay, this is going to happen here and this is going to happen here and this is going to happen here. Yeah, um, it is just sort of moving things around until it feels right. It, it, most of the time, it's like that. How does that process uh, correlate with performing live? Like, if you make a kick-ass album with a lot of, you know, editing, where you're able to kind of scoot things around and delete them, how do you then prepare for a live show? Uh, that also, kicks ass. The 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 one thing that that's really beneficial to me is because I, because everything is assembled, you know, in a computer, um, on a computer, I, I, I basically have stems, I have loops, so mm -hmm. I can, I basically load up a sampler and then, um, I don't trigger everything live. Like there's always a, there's, there's like a backing, but it's like the bare bones, like the structure of the, you yeah. know, it's the baseline of the song or whatever. And then I add other stuff on top of it. So there is even, even when it's really structured and rigid, there's still an element of kind of spontaneity and improvisation because I have an idea of what I'm going to do, but things always could be a little, you know, things don't always go the way you plan. Of course. Yeah. Um, someone from Patreon, one of the maniac circle supporters um, asked a question for you. They wanted to talk, they wanted to, to know specifically more about your collaboration with theologian. Yep. And particularly the icy bleakness of things, how that came about, and um, was it intended to score Thomas Ligotti readings? Uh, I think I could talk about this. Um, so y yes and no is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. um, for a while, um, Lee, as theologian, was doing um, sound design for Cadabra Records, um, the, the, uh, readings of HP Lovecraft books, like, you know, mm -hmm. audio book on, on record and Lee does the sound design and he did four or five of them and they're really good. Um, so he got in the very early stages of playing, they did a Thomas Ligotti, um, uh, record. And in the very early stages of the planning, Lee was contacted and said, Hey, you know, can we tap you for sound? And he was like, yeah, sure. So he brought me on mm -hmm. and we, did the whole thing. We recorded the whole thing. And they just, I don't even know if they heard it, but they decided that they were going to go with a different sound designer. And I don't, I don't remember oh. who it is. Um, and we just kind of had an hour's worth of material that we're like, okay, well we worked really hard on this and it's, it's pretty good. Um, what should we do with it? So yeah. I we brought it to Marcus and he was like, Oh yeah, no problem. I'll put a tape out for you. Yeah. Um, so I, I think there was some minor minor edits to it because in the original, like it was it was for Ligotti and it was you know there was some aspects to it that were 
kind of involved in the story. So we, we took a few things out just to make it its own thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, even the, like the titles, like we, that's all from Lugati. Just, we didn't, we didn't change almost, we didn't change very much about it. So. Yeah. Sounds like that should be, I mean, what was the presentation going to be like? If I, if I understand correctly, that was going to be a, an LP. Yeah. Can, 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 can can I don't know if I'm not familiar with that. They, they do like really, you get, you should look them up. They do like really super deluxe, like, you know, triple quadruple gatefold LPs with yeah. just crazy artwork and, um, it would, I, I imagine it would have been something like, and, and you know, the, it, the album got released with whoever the new sound designer was. So I, I haven't heard it. I don't know if it's, I'm sure it's good. Um, and it's with, and it's, and it's an accompaniment to an audio reading of his text. Yeah. Of the someone's reading a Ligotti story. And uh -huh. then, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's like an, uh, not an audio book, like a, like an old radio play or something. Where yeah. 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 Some yeah. Design background of somebody reading. Okay, cool. Damn. Yeah. So, could have been a it, it could have been a bigger thing but it wasn't and that's cool you know it's still yeah. you know the tape's still a recording yeah. yeah yeah people like it so that's yeah. cool i'm good with okay. that in, in working with theologian in general how how did that working relationship come about was that the first time no uh no um the first time was uh so i've been i've been a big fan of lee's for a really long time and like long before I met him, um, or long before like we became friends. Yeah. Um, and he, right after Wretch came out, he, he emailed me about something and we had never really like spent too much time talking before. So I didn't, I didn't really know him terribly well. Um, but he wrote me an email and you know, about, I think I might've put in a tape out for him or something. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. Um, but at the end he wrote PS Wretch is amazing. And I was like, Oh my God, like, yeah. holy shit. Like that was a big deal to me. Um, because I, I looked up to him so much and I really, I just admire everything he does. Um, so I was like, no, that's fucking huge. So then he, he got the idea to, he did a release called Wretch Reimagined where I sent him all the multi-tracks mm. to the whole album and he remixed it into a, I think a 60 minute thing. Um, I don't even think I have a copy of it actually, hmm. but, um, that was the first thing we did together, but like he released it, he put out a t-shirt and we did like a, a CDR as well. Like it was a whole package thing. Well, I, I feel like I remember that, but I don't, I know I never heard yeah, it. That was, that was 2009. That was old like maniacs board era. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, remember, yeah. I remember promoting it on there. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, that's how we, we started. And then. He was when he was doing the uh, Apex festivals. He did. I think I played the third one, mm -hmm. um, and I think that was the first time he booked me. And then basically, it, basically since then, it was like we've just sort of we've become really good friends. And and you know, like mu music aside, um, we have a lot in common. And you know, I just like I'll you know go visit him and Gretchen and hang out and you know not even do music stuff. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, 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 it's a sort of an ongoing collaboration all the time and it's always pretty fruitful. Cool. Yeah. It seems like, it seems like you guys have a really good synergy and. I, we, I think we want a lot of the same things musically. Yeah. On the White Centipede Noise Patreon with today's episode, there's an excellent unreleased 26 minute Vomit Arsonist track recorded as a rehearsal for his Dominion of Flesh set in September, 2022. For the heavy sponsors and noise fiends, I have one copy of the limited edition promo cassette version of the newest Vomit Arsonist album on Cloister. There is no future I want to be a part of. I'm giving it away to the first person that comments on the post that pops up after the episode ends. I try to give away some special physical merch to supporters of that tier with each episode, and they also get early access to incoming distro items. So if that's your thing and you want to give heavy support to White Sand Noise Podcast, consider signing up for that tier. Maniac Circle supporters, of course, get access to the Discord server and digital gifts in conjunction with most episodes, like today's track, for example. And if you want to just be sure you get the full content of each episode and WCN TV episodes on the weeks that the podcast doesn't air, you can support for just five euros a month. The reason I push the Patreon so hard is because each episode of the podcast takes me an average of 30 hours of work to produce. So even though it's available to the public, it isn't free. For the price of a cup of coffee or a glass of beer each month, you can support the work of this podcast in a way that literally makes a night and day difference between survival and defeat. 
I really believe that the Noise Underground is one of the last truly organic and independent constellations still active, and as members, we need to take care that it doesn't get pushed out like everything else that isn't easily exploited and co-opted. With times getting tougher all around, it's more important than ever to support our own scene and show each other that this is more than replaceable entertainment or a hobby. Whether you support this podcast or not, remember that you vote for what's important to you with your dollars, so please be sure you vote for Noise. Now back to the Vomit Arsonist. You mentioned putting out a theologian release and yep. that brings me to your label danvers state yep which um is a pretty interesting label just because you you're you're such a in the sense that you're such a prolific artist and all of your work is very personal yet you still take the time you know st- consistently from i don't know when this label started 2008 or something like that yeah, yeah. um you know you're Really, and mostly on cassette, you know, not like ever blowing up and burning out, but like smaller edition cassettes of artists throughout. I mean, you have quite a like a, quite a large discography with it, and it, you know, yeah. I don't know. I, I I know everyone who does noise or industrial has a label in, in some way, but I mean, it's it's somehow it's sort of remarkable that you've you've been so consistent and 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 steady with it throughout the the years, and you're still working with it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yes, and no. I haven't. I haven't put out anything since la- uh, last year. Yeah, I don't. That's still... uh, but, but it's it's. I mean, you know, it's 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 gotten more difficult to run any kind of label as time has gone on, and sure. like it mostly just that the expense of it is just insane. Like, yeah, um, you know, it, it used to be cheap to produce, you know, fifty tapes, and it's not cheap anymore, yeah. like at all, right. Um, so I, I've I've really scaled back on releasing stuff, but I think I'm hesitant to say like it's done. But maybe it doesn't maybe. it doesn't yeah. ever have to die. But I mean, it can it's always kind of dormant right now. I think yeah, dormant yeah. is is a good word. But yeah. what what is it that you get out of releasing music as opposed to releasing music from other people as opposed to your own? Um, originally it was just a way to make connections with people. Cause I was, I was trying to, like, I, the reason I started it was because I, I sent the reciprocation tape actually to, excuse me, um, a label and they responded and they were like, Hey, it's great. We're not doing tapes. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay. So, um, I kind of gave up and was like, Oh, fucking I'll do it myself. Yeah. Um, so I did like 25 copies of it or something. And, but right away I was like, I don't want to do that thing where like you just release your own material like there's nothing wrong with that like i I know there's plenty of people who do release their own stuff and that's absolutely fine i just didn't want to do that yeah um so i was like all right i'll branch out and see who i can contact and just pretty quickly got like a a decent roster of people Mm -hmm. um you know it was getting to the point where it's like you know i'm at a show or whatever i'm playing a show hey you want to do a tape like just you know that was a great set do a tape for me yep and uh, yeah, it's just it kind of just naturally progressed, and then yeah, I don't know. That's really with about it. <laughs> with, with the co- I mean, you with the costs getting so tough yeah. to do things on kind of a small scale. What do you think is the future of of that type of, of the of the underground? I mean, of, of underground yeah. music releasing. I mean, it, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Like it's, it'll always be around and it's, it's, it's always, I mean, it's always morphed and, and changed with the times and stuff. Um, so I, it's not, you know, it's not going away, but like it is, it's getting, there's, it's getting prohibitively expensive and, and difficult to do things on a smaller scale, mm-hmm. but there are always going to be people who are willing to deal with that expense and to, to, just push through that and be like, yeah, well, you know what? It's going to cost me $500 instead of, you know, and it should have cost me two, but fuck it. I want to do this because this is important. And, yeah. you know, I believe in this and, and there's always going to be those people. Yeah. Um, so I think, do you think, it, do, you mean, do you mean like bigger, la- do you mean like bigger labels or something like that? That are like more invested in it? Like on a, yeah, yeah. I, I, people who are, who have, uh, I don't want to say more passionate, but like, they're just you know, more invested in it. Like it's a bigger thing for them. Like for me personally, like I love doing Danvers, but it's, it's, you know, it's on, it's on the back burner and that's, that's fine. 
Yeah. Um, there's people who are better than me and more willing than me to do more things and please like do them. Um, you know, I'll step aside and that's fine. Um, but yeah, there's always, I think there's always going to be people who are just going to, regardless of the circumstances or the challenges, they're always just going to do it. Yeah. And that's great. That's what we need. And is that the same kind of enjoyment you get from it? I mean, I know it's on the back burner, but in the recent years when you've done it, is that the same kind of enjoyment that you get from it when you did it at the beginning, like meeting people and just, Hey, let's put something out or, or, or it's, um, yeah, yes, yes. And no, it's, it's a little different now because you know, just you, there's been a lot of like repeat acts, which is great. You know, I've done a few tapes for this person, a few tapes for that person. Um, it's, it's not, there, there was definitely, um, in the, in the very beginning, like 2008, 2009, it was, it was more, you know, I don't know, it was more exciting, I guess, because mm -hmm. I was still, there was an element of discovery to everything. Like I didn't, you know, Oh, oh my God, I wrote, I emailed dissecting table and he said, yes, like yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. Which is, you know, you still have that, you know, you can still get that reaction. Like I did a tape for, um, uh, Azoikum and like yeah. he emailed me and was like, do you want to put this out? And I was like, holy shit. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, just like he thought of me first. That was great. Um, so there's, there's still that, but it's, it becomes more kind of like a routine thing and just sort of going through the motions, I guess. Uh, but you know, I didn't, I didn't ever stop doing it. So yeah. I liked it to some degree. Do you think social media has changed that type of relationship dynamic? I mean, I just thought of that fact that, you know, it used to be like you email someone that's, you know, you know, you, you ask someone for someone's email. You don't know if that still is active. You don't know if they exist still and you email them. And then maybe like a week later you get a response and they say yes or whatever. And it's like, Whoa, but you know, now there's not, it's like, everyone's there. I mean, not everyone, but it's like everyone's on Instagram, for example. I mean, it's Instagram yeah, now. It could be something different in a couple of years, but it's like, everyone's kind of there showing their stuff promoting their current activities, promoting their past activities. Yeah. So it's, I don't, do you feel like it's a little bit less? Yeah. It's, it's, more, it's, more, it's more, it's more accessible. So that maybe makes it less exciting. Yeah. It's less special. I think um, that's like, that's how it feels to me because you know, it is like you, we, we live in a world where you can, you can send anyone a message. They, they probably won't respond to you, but you can, like you can contact anybody you want yeah. and that's a good thing and a bad thing. I think, um, yeah. I guess ultimately it's probably a good thing. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's it, social media definitely had an impact on it. It's just, it's, there's too much of everything, you know, there's too much access to stuff. There's too much. Everyone's pushing everything. It's, it's yeah. too chaotic. And that combined with like high costs, for example, of tapes, I guess it makes an interesting combination of. It just makes it tough. Coming. Like, like I mean, I, I can, I can remember, like you know. Again, it's it's two thousand eight, two thousand nine. So it's you can't like compare the costs or anything really. But like I used to ship. I used to the tapes were five bucks shipped. Yeah, like, yeah. PP seven dollars if you live outside of the United States. Like, yeah. and I could ship that. I, I could I could produce the tape, buy the shipping supplies, ship it, and still make like two bucks yeah. per tape. It was, yeah. and you know now it, if if it costs seven dollars to ship, you're lucky, right? Like it's 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 crazy. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. It's 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 different. It's different for sure. It feels weird to. I mean, it's like even just the recent update I did entering all the stuff in the shop and pricing it and like, just kind of like, just, you know, I just do a calculation. Like what did I pay for wholesale? Yeah, yeah. What did I pay for shipping? Do my little markup and then I have to do tax now. And it's like, yeah. And you see like, how I got to sell them for $13 or $15. Yeah. Like, well, pff, I don't know. And, and like, and I don't, I don't fault anybody for doing that. Like I get it. I mean, but I mean, we're like, you pay $35 for a t-shirt now. Yeah. Like it, I, everything's more expensive. I get it. It just sucks. Like I wish it, yeah. I wish it there it is. Yeah. It's not, I mean, it's not, there's only so much money to go around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean like, and, and, and when, and when there's $5 tapes, you can be a lot more. You can get you can more. Check, you can check more out. You can, you can, yeah. you can, 
you can take more chances, I think. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, you know, trade, I, I noticed, I still trade a lot, but people are hesitant to trade. I, I haven't done it. I used to, I used to trade all the time. And like, I, I still do it a little bit, but um, mostly with people who are, you know, like I trade with Marcus all the time. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, like he's got a new batch of shit coming out and we'll just trade whatever. Yeah. Uh, but it used to be like, you could email like, oh, so-and-so did a release. Can I trade you this for it? And, you know, now yeah. that doesn't really happen anymore because you got to spend 10 bucks to send the thing out. Like, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Tell me about Red Glory. Yeah. Uh, Red Glory was, Red Glory is something I really want to get back to actually. Um, it's a cool project. Thank you. Um, I did that, that, how did that start? That was me trying to do like um, very blatantly copying like like in, like old the old Italian guys at Morgue and 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 things like that. Just really kind of monotonous, cold, dead synth stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I did it all. It was all recorded to tape, which. I don't usually do. Mm -hmm. um, it was all recorded live. I didn't do any overdubs or any effects or anything like that. I did like a little bit of EQing after the fact, but that was it. I tried to keep it as as like pure as I could, um, and it was all it was all improvised. So just sort of, and I, I again I tried to do sort of like what Marco would do, which is like turn on your gear, hit record, play, release yeah. is done. Yeah. Um, that was the the yeah the the two tapes that I did. That's kind of how it started and it was just it was just you know it sounds kind of like the vomit arsonist but it's a little more reserved and there's no vocals or anything yeah um but uh yeah i, I want to get back to that i really liked really like that project another person from patreon wanted to ask how do you approach mastering noise versus other genres of music uh i've really only ever mastered noise so okay um and it's uh, again, I'm not a mastering engineer, so um, it's it's you know it sounds it, it sounds good to my ears. It's basically mm -hmm. what it comes down to. Um, there was and 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 you know there's always back and forth with the artist about you know hey could you make this sound a little more like this and da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. um, and that's I always try to you know like I'll keep doing it until you know you're happy with it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's mostly just like, it sounds good to me. This is how I, like, if I put this album on, I think it sounds as good as it's going to get. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if usually people agree, which is nice. Um, but yeah, I, I, I've, I, I don't, I don't want to, I'm not a, not a master engineer. So like, I don't want to put that you're basically out. You're lending your ears. Yeah, basically, yeah, yeah, and like I can make some adjustments for you that I think will sound good, and if if you're happy with them, cool, yeah. let's go with it. Yeah, I've noticed a you know with your the people you collaborate with, and meeting you one time or two times back in the day at shows, and you know that a sense of camaraderie is very strong with you, and there are certain people you really are close with. Mm -hmm. and on a on a personal and artistic level for example well, one one thing for example that I think we should talk about is the fact that um you know Mac told me that he's going to be bring you to California yeah. in September yeah. to play two shows i think he said the 29th of September would be at Los Angeles and 30th would be somewhere in the bay area yeah, Oakland or San Francisco. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, which, by the way, do you, are, are there any plans you have specifically for that, or is there anything special that you? That 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 was a Max sent me a message and was like, "Hey, can you get this time off of work?" I was like, "Yeah, probably." What do you got? He's like, "We we want to fly you out for some shows." And I was like, "Okay, sure, shit." So uh, that that just sort of came out of nowhere, um, nice. which was awesome. Um, but no, I, I don't I don't have anything special planned. I probably should get working on a set because it's going to come up quick. Um, Sometime. But uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I've never been out there, so I'm really looking forward to those. Nice. That'll be good. But in terms of, yeah, so who, who are some of your closest allies or comrades that you really, you know, 
click with and who are important for you, who you've felt a lot of support from and who you like to support and maybe talk about why. Yeah. Um, I mean, definitely, uh, Lee from theologian and Nihilus. He's, he's probably, I probably put him at the top. I mean, I, we've, we've been friends for a long time now and, and we've, you know, I've played on theologian albums. I've played with him live. He's played with me. Like we've just, we've really kind of meshed into this really good thing. And he's a good friend too. Um, yeah. Um, definitely Lee, um, even Mac, I mean, Mac, I've known for a long time. Um, like old, again, old maniacs board. That's yeah. like where we first started talking in like 2007 or eight or something. Yeah. Um, and we kind of lost touch for a little while cause he was off doing his own thing. But you know, the past few years, um, he's been, he's been going forward and he's just like it, him, him and Sam both are like incredibly supportive and, uh, I don't know. You don't, you don't, that's, that's oftentimes that's hard to find. Yeah. Um, but it's important. And you know, the fact that they're, they're all fucking great musicians as well is sort of a bonus. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. And, and it's, that's, it's important to have that stuff. I think it is. I think being vocally supportive of your friends is underrated. Yeah. I'd yeah, like, definitely. I'd like, little, yeah. I'd like to see a little more of that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Like you know, I think uh, that's that's something to Mac Mac and Sam's real credit is that they are very happy to shine the light on others, share the spotlight. You know, there's not. I feel like there's sometimes a certain selfishness that people have, kind of about, oh, here's my thing. I don't want to. I worked really hard to get here. I'm not letting anybody else in, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I don't want to look, you know, I don't want to praise anyone else too much because I don't want to look like I'm a fanboy or, you know, I don't know what it, I don't know what it is, but but yeah, there's there's you know like I mean? an element of to it almost. There's something going on there which yeah, I I like to see people who, you know, will loudly big up their friends, give them opportunities. Yeah. Not just their friends, but you know, artists that they that they artists like. that they admire, artists that they enjoy. Yeah. Like it's, it's, you know, that's that's what keeps it all going. Like you, exactly. you got to have that stuff. Like you need yeah. to do that. Yeah. And I, I I agree. Like it's there should be more of that. And it and I mean I'm guilty of not doing it too. Like absolutely. Um, especially, with, I mean, I, I think about it sometimes, especially with social media being just that. Like it's if it has any sort of value, it's for the ability to promote. You know promote not just yourself, but other things, you know, it's like, and I feel like there, there's a, there's sometimes a kind of a bitter atmosphere. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely a, a bitter, just in general, it's just a, yeah, it's a bitter place, but people not, but no, people, I, people within the scene, not really wanting to give each other any too much, too much of anything. It's kind of yeah, like, you don't want to you don't want to come off like you know like you're like you said like you're being a fanboy or something. So you don't want to yeah. praise someone too much and and like you know sometimes that can come off as weird, I guess. But you know ultimately, like if if you're into what someone's doing, you know talk about it. Like yeah. get we're all you know everyone's trying to get their shit out there. Just if you can help with that in any way, yeah, do so. You know, as you know, I want to ask you to tell me your top five noise slash industrial slash power electronics experimental releases of all time. Yep. I've been thinking about this. Um, I think at the very top is probably um, the Church of Dead Girls from Navicon Torture Technologies mm-hmm. um, that had a fucking profound effect on me. I got it. I think that was the first NTT album I ever had. Um, I bought it used at a local record store and I was like, Oh yeah, I, I haven't heard this. And just like completely like changed what I wanted to do. And I, and like, I was like, this is that, like, that was a huge shift. Like hearing mm-hmm. that, was like, oh, this is the kind of thing I want to do. Like, just 
there was there's so much like pain and just misery in that in, in, in all in all of NTT's work, but that album specifically is just so you know, like upsetting, and that's yeah, I'd say that's probably the top for me. Mm-hmm. May all be dead, brighter death now. Yep. Um, I was gonna say inner war, but may all be dead was the first one I ever got, and holds a special place in my heart mm. for that reason. Closure, IRM. Cool. Um, That's a good one. Yeah. Which is that? That was another one that, like, when I heard it, that like it, it completely changed what you think power electronics can be. Right. Um, like, you want to talk like cinematic? Like, that is a cinematic album. Yeah. And the thing that really sold me on it was like, none of the songs have titles. They're all just closure one, two, three. Um, but I was, I remember I was driving to work and it was like pouring rain and I had it up really loud and it gets to the fourth or fifth track. And all of a sudden I hear Robert Johnson lyrics. And I was like, Holy shit, this is the, the IRM covered like an old blues song yeah. uh, from like 1930. And I was like, and that like galvanized it. And I was like, okay, this is, this is their best. Like, this yeah. is my absolute favorite. And it works contextually in the album. Like, it all makes sense. It doesn't seem weird or anything. Um, but yeah, that's a, that is a fantastic album. Um, so NTT, Brighter Death Now, IRM. Um, Sickness Report, Tracks More. Mm-hmm. Um, I could pick a lot of his stuff, but I think that's probably the easiest one to go with. I think it's yeah. probably the one I return to the most. Um, interesting though because it's one of the I mean not maybe one of the only or one of the few with no vocals yeah yeah which is I I I think I, I typically like his stuff with vocals more but I don't know something about that album is just re- it's so it just sounds like so clinical and, and yeah like that's great cold and really there's, a, there's an atmosphere and like a mood to it that's just you yeah that he almost doesn't reach on anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that one and probably uh, Pleasure Ground by Purian. Mm-hmm. That's another one that was a huge, had a huge impact. Um, that came out like early 2005, something like that, 2006. Sure. Um, I saw, I'd seen Purian a bunch of times before, but it was. I think it was like like Dom was living in Providence for a long time. That's and right. And then he moved to New York, and then he came. I think it was the first time he came back to play a show, mm-hmm. like it was like 2006 maybe. Um, and he was playing Pleasure Ground material, and I you know I hadn't heard it. It was new, and that absolutely blew me away. Like because he hadn't been doing a ton of the stuff with synthesizers yet. It was yeah, and I've seen him mostly with just you know he's got the the mic and the the Fender blender and the octave pedal and all that, and that was it, and that was great. But like it added this whole new element of kind of despair. I bet. Um, so I immediately I got he, he played. He ran off, ran over to the merch table. I went and bought the album, and then you know listened to it when I got home. And it's just it's such a that is such an emotional effect on me. Like yeah, it brings every time I listen to that album, it brings me to a very specific place, and it's not a great place. Yeah. So I don't listen to it very often. Yeah. Um, but I think anything that has that kind of power and that that kind of that could do that consistently every time I hear it is just like I'd be I have to put that in my top I think for sure yeah that is such an album I've, I haven't listened to it in probably ten to fifteen years but yeah it's still like it's it's it's, it's absolutely my favorite of his and like it was almost like I mean I, I like plenty of his stuff but it was almost like. Well, he's no, no, nothing's ever going to top this. Like, yeah. This is this is the best. Yeah, but yeah. cool. So yeah, I think those are my five. Good list. Um, what about five things? You know, I'm I've started being more merciful with people. They don't even name five new releases of the past year or two, but five newer releases or artists could also be performances of the past uh, few years that you've seen that that have really impressed you this is this is tougher because i don't i i'm not good at keeping up with new stuff or a lot of new stuff um the agonal lust tape on hospital that just came out was really good mm-hmm. um, did you get the did you get the the physical 
tape with the interview? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the uh, the, the the cool little embossed hospital logo. Yeah, on the, in- I, saw, I saw that. I didn't I didn't get that one. I I I would like. I think I think that's really cool that he was doing that little short interview. Yeah, it's a nice, nice touch for sure. With the with the tapes, it's a really nice touch. But I, I would like to read it. I never got it. The Crawl of Time album on Phage, the CD, uh, growing in the fertile dirt. Yep. Of her memories, or I, I don't remember the the name, the title exactly. Um, that came out right around the same time as the LP on Cloister, which came out around the same time as my album. So I yeah. kind of equate those all together. Mm-hmm. But like the LP on Cloister was great. That CD on Fade is fucking amazing. Yeah. That that like it's all it's all good, but that one that one hit like a truck. That was For sure. That was really good. I don't have the album yet, but what I've heard of um, the new Commuter is really mm-hmm. good. Yep. Like I, I really like the idea of just like pretty much just field recordings and, and effects and stuff. Like that's that's really good. I've listened to it. I don't own it yet. Oh, uh, a few years ago, Cryocene. Yeah. On New Forces. That was fucking yep. fantastic. That's really good. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. That was really good. Yeah. And then um Form Hunter. They, they actually just played here last night and I didn't go. Oh um, you didn't go? <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, they're they're also excellent. So yeah, yeah, yeah go with that. Why didn't you go? Uh, I I really I didn't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't feel like it. Yeah, I had, I worked yesterday and I got home and I was tired and it, the show started late. It was like a ten o'clock, eleven o'clock show. Yeah, I, didn't, yeah. I, I don't I don't go out much. So yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I guess I just it, there hasn't been something of that ilk in Cologne for. Or, you know, like... Yeah, do you I get would... a lot of like, stuff going on? I mean, no, 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 no. Damn, that's awesome. If, if, if it does go on, then I'm the one who, who put it on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How and, far do you, do you have to travel far to, like, go see a show? I mean... uh, Yeah, I mean... N- yeah, for sure. I don't... I haven't seen real shows. And, I mean, I'm going to Leiden in the Netherlands, which is, like, three hours away uh, next week to play. Yeah, yeah. Um that's where I've seen a few shows over the past couple of years, but Col- I mean, you know, I haven't even really gone to Berlin. Berlin's really far too. Um, and pff, nothing happens in Cologne and the, the city is very not, not open to that kind of thing. So it just doesn't yeah, happen. Okay. So, I mean, if it's like for- form Hunter was playing in the city and <laughs> that's yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All, I'm, I'm, all I'm trying to say is you're, is you're, you're lucky. You have a luxury that you could, you could be like, eh, Nah, I'm gonna sit that one out. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, fact that I, the fact that they could come to town, and I'm like, I'll catch them next time. Catch yeah, them next yeah. time, yeah, <laughs> exactly. You're absolutely right. I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't take that kind of thing for granted. Yeah, or or you can, but I mean, it's like yeah, I, can. I can't okay. imagine. What do you got in the works otherwise? I mean, there's the show coming yeah, up. The, there's the shows the coming album. up. Those two shows, and there's yeah. the the God is War collaboration, which is pretty exciting, yeah. which you already mentioned. Yeah. But what else have you got? Um, I'm mostly done uh new full length um i think cloister is going to put it out we we talked about a cd but i'm it was kind of up in the air Mm. um it's not it's not done i don't have like it doesn't have a title and you know it's 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 pretty close but i gotta i need to like buckle down and just finish it um but other than that um i really want to do more red glory stuff I really like that because it doesn't require a lot of thinking. Mm-hmm. It's just sort of like you can, it, it, it fulfills a very specific need of just turning on your gear and going. Yeah. Um, and um, plus I like to improvise stuff. I think that's, that's always fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, just, you know, doing a couple local shows uh, around Rhode Island, nothing, nothing huge, but you know, still trying to get out there a little bit. Yeah. And then, um, I want to tour again, but that's that's tough. Um, so for what maybe reason? Next year. Was that for what reason? Is it tough? I get time off work, yeah. and you know that, that's that's really that's mostly what it is. I work at a college, okay. So um, it's there's never a great time to take you know two weeks off of work, right? Right. Um, right. But you know it, it's it's not impossible. So we'll yeah. see if the right opportunity comes along. I do it. 
Seems like it seems like everyone's well, not everyone. But it seems like there's some, some good tours coming. Are the are the Texas guys coming through Providence? No, they're not. Uh, I don't think so. At least I think they're going to New York, but I don't think they're coming to Providence. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, like six bands on that tour. That's a huge. Yeah, fight. they they keep adding more. The traveling <laughs> festival, like yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's great. Like I haven't seen those guys in years. That that's going to be awesome. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, everybody's touring right now. Like tons of people are on tour like to the point where it's like you know you look ahead like in like september and it's like okay there's four shows happening in this one week you know all back to back to back to back um it's great yeah everyone, everyone's busy it's good you better get out to some of those shows yeah no i definitely will yeah i definitely will cool yeah anything else you uh can you add or let us know about or you want to mention shout out uh, no, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I talked. I, I said everything I think I had to say. Um, I know you got a lot more to say, but I mean, we 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 really could talk about each one of your albums in depth because I really I really think it's fascinating there's, there's how much plenty, how much you. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of <laughs> yeah of stuff. Exactly, um, which hopefully we can do at a later date. But um, yeah, no, give people a good chance to a good taste to know where they can begin and dig in. Yeah, and, 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 and Cloister is still available from. Yeah. I've got one copy left. Cloister still got them in stock. Yep, yeah, I have a bunch too. So. Yep. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, Just to reach out to you. I've got plenty of copies of my own stuff, and and I'm always if anybody like wants to ask about something like I don't know, I should put that out there. I guess talk to me about shit. Like you can ask me questions, and I'll probably answer them. <laughs> um, yeah, because I, I like I like talking about the process and and. And yeah. Whatnot. Do you get that a fair amount? Uh, not a ton. Um, but no, not, not a ton, but you know, I'm open to it. It's cool. I, I just, you know, like talking shop and stuff. Here's just a thought that came to my mind. Like more noise artists should do like Q and a, Absolutely. Ask me anything yeah. kind of stuff. Like, why yeah. not? What? How did you get this sound? What was going on when this, when you did exactly. this? Or like, what was this show? Like, yeah, just, yeah, like a, like a, a like a Reddit AMA kind of thing. Exactly. Like, just, like I mean, I, I, I can't be the only, I mean, don't wait for me to do it. Like, like, I mean, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, like, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely you know right. Yeah. Like, like, I don't know. You should, you, you should try to set that. Or some, I don't know. Some, someone listening should try to set that up. Like, hey, I'm going, whether it be on Instagram or on YouTube or whatever, just like, hey, I'm going live on yeah, on yeah. the weekend at this time. Like, hop on and like ask me questions. I, or... I, I think I think a lot of, and I would include myself in this, I think a lot of people might be, or some people might be hesitant because it's like, like hesitant to do that because it's, it's like, like well, does anybody give a shit what I have to say? I know. Like, why, I know. Everyone's very humble, and that's good. Yeah, so. like I just, I, I kind of like me personally. Like I'm like, I don't, I'm like, nobody wants to fucking hear what I have to say. Like, why am I gonna like? Oh, I'm on Instagram Live. Like, <laughs> but, I mean, but I get, I, I know, but I mean, it's still a cool opportunity. It's still a good opportunity. You're, you're absolutely right. It's the, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think that's what those, if those platforms are there, then people should use it more for that kind of stuff. Yeah, not, oh, not every artist. Oh. It's not every artist's position or 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 vision to put themselves out there in that way but for for some i think it'd be cool and why yeah, not absolutely I'd, I'd watch that kind of stuff for sure i'm actually hoping to do a episode of the podcast soon with hopefully well hopefully i'm not getting in trouble by saying this probably but with richard ramirez Ooh, in nice. that way because he's done you know two great interviews on yeah. noise extra and on uh, harsh truth so yeah you know, basically, that's the only reason I haven't had him on yet, just because I thought, well, you know, he's done two pretty, pretty full interviews recently. So, but I thought there are still a lot of things that people want to know that, you know, I want to yeah. know, but I hear, you know, there's message boards talk about, oh, this release, that release, what's up with that, what's up with that. He's got, yeah. he's done so much. I mean, I speculate awesome. too much on, on deadline and I, I always talk about it. It's like, I thought, okay, well, I should get him in an interview, but I was like, well, better than me coming up with what I could think to ask him, like, 
yeah. maybe ask people what they want to yeah, know. Yeah, or, or, or bring people into like a video, like a like a group interview. Yeah, yeah. And have you, let, have you met Richard before? Have you talked to him? I have met Richard uh, numerous times. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and I, I asked him about it. He's so I mean, he's open to it. So yeah, he's, he's such a he's a wonderful person. Just yeah, so absolutely. Very so, open, very forthcoming. So I mean, I that's why I'm, I feel somewhat comfortable saying this publicly is because we already talked about it and he said he's he's into it. So yeah, yeah. Um, I think that you know, yeah, do one with do one with with you. I don't know. Let's let's, let's get one going. Hey, why not? Let's do it. <laughs> oh, speaking of Richard Ramirez, if I could add a sixth to my list, yes, tracking device, Richard Ramirez tracking device on free all, your all-time list. Yes, absolutely. That is a power electronics album without vocals. It is fantastic. Yep, it's. I love that one. So, just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> Sick. All right, great. Good top six. Well, cool, Andy. Thank you so much. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. It was an honor. It was a pleasure. And we'll talk soon. Yeah, talk to you soon. But in the Patreon exclusive extended segments of this episode, we talk about Andrew's use of his samples in his work and a memorable show at the Borg War in Milwaukee where Death Jenk played with the Vomit Arsonist. You can see all that and more at patreon.com slash white centipede noise. Next Monday, there's a WCN TV episode, and the week after that, I'm joined by Gabriel Giuliani of Dead Body Love. Thanks for your support and see you soon.